years ago, war reached into the American home, and the farewells were everywhere. The farms, the shanty on the tracks, the lavish apartments, the uptown flats, the shrubbed estates, the modest houses of the suburban streets. Everywhere, the men were borrowed or taken for keeps. The youngest, the cleanest, the best. Each man went into battle in his own way to do his own job. More than half of them saw combat service. A small percentage of these, not nearly as many as you may imagine, were in the front lines, in bullet and shell range of the enemy. For anyone of this latter group, a very special experience. He was, at any moment, expendable. For him, the baseball parks were full of late, exciting rallies. For him, the beach parties were not as pleasant as they had been a few summers before. For him, the rivers ran high. And the boating was not so good. For him, the flight decks were not as wide as the fields of Texas. For the rest, there were a thousand odd military jobs, each dependent on the other, each vital to the winning of the war each made memorable by the fact that it represented the protection of the lives and security of all of us. But whether in combat or not, whether a machine gunner 300 yards from the enemy or a switchboard operator 300 miles from the enemy, the serviceman learned about war. He knew the unutterable loneliness of it. He knew the unending boredom of it. He knew the mud of it the dust of it. He knew the food of it. He knew the coffee of it. Whether in the heat of the equator or the cold of the Arctic, through it all he worked and waited and suffered and endured. Until one day he heard the bells of peace turned his back on the darkened battlefields and raised his arms to the bright, new future. Now he returns with all his experiences in the fight to kill fascism, to kill Japism. Now he returns with him, those who gave a permanent share of their bodies and minds to the nation. The permanently wounded physically, 1% of all returning servicemen. Those with severe emotional disorders, 1% of all returning servicemen. But returning with them, the huge majority group, more than nine out of 10, the unhurt physically or mentally, the average returning soldier, it is of him we speak, of this average soldier, that we report on the questions, has he changed? What has he learned? What does he want? Has he been brutalized by war? Can he readjust to the life and times of a civilian? Readjust? Consider some of his adjustments of the last few years. He adjusted to a considerable loss of privacy. 
he adjusted to the often unbearable authority of the top sergeant. He adjusted to 50 bucks a month. He adjusted to the foxhole, the slit trench, and a number of unprecedented ways of going to bed. He adjusted to plenty. Through it all, he kept his stride. He didn't lose his sense of humor. He brought the touch of the Connecticut Yankee to the banks of the Rhine. He ran a country fair in India. He staged a Kentucky Derby in Austria. He relaxed in the luxurious resorts of Europe and went night clubbing in the islands of the Pacific. In England, he learned about rugby. And somewhere in the Mediterranean, he discovered an old Egyptian game called Three Card Monte. He kept his stride. He didn't lose his sense of decency. There were times when he went hungry so that the kids would not. He was an ambassador to the children of the world. Let those who worry about his painful readjustment to civilian life remember his adjustment to war. Now he returns, the average soldier. Has he been brutalized by war? Listen to a very angry army chaplain. Brutalized? That means, is this war going to breed a generation of hoodlums and gangsters who hold life cheaply? I've seen killing, but I've never met an American soldier who liked it. I've seen men under combat achieve a feeling of humanity such as I'm sure they'd never known before. Seen them comfort each other when homesickness shattered their spirit. Laugh together over common discomforts. Cry unashamedly when their comrades died. And without hesitation offer the final sacrifice. The risk of their lives to save another man's life. I saw democracy overseas as it's only talked about at home. There were no foxhole penthouses for the wealthy. No restricted areas for white Christians only. Brutality is something more than a surface matter revealed by rough beards, bloodshot eyes, strong language, torn clothes, muddy bodies. Real brutality is lack of imagination, a disregard for the rights of others. The very things we've been fighting to destroy if there's any suspicion that returning soldiers are not fit for our civilization, I can only say it's an indictment of our civilization, not of the soldiers. What did the average soldier learn in the army? Well, among other things, he learned a certain self-reliance, a certain resourcefulness. There were washing machines made in wondrous ways. When he didn't have a ladder, he used an elephant. To the infinite virtues of the Jeep, he added a new one. He jacked it up and turned it into an ice cream freezer. And when his life depended on it, he used a parachute for an air brake.
He learned the quintessence of democracy. He learned to work with people. Because he knew how many people depended on him and how he depended on them. He was a man in the air, directing a man on the ground where the artillery should fire. He was a man on the ground, directing a man in the air where to drop his bombs. He learned to work with people. Whether he was one of two men in an observation post, one of five men in a B-25 bomber crew, one of ten men in an anti-aircraft battery, or one of five dozen clerks in the rear echelon headquarters. Has he changed? Listen to a very calm war correspondent. Sure, I suppose he's changed. Say, he may have left home a mama's boy. I doubt that he'll be coming back that way. Chances are, he'll seem a lot older, more thoughtful. He'll wonder about things, question things a good deal more. You don't go through hell and high water and stay unchanged. You don't see your friends die or badly hurt and stay the same. Yes, he's changed in many ways, but they're good, sound ways. By and large, he's in better physical condition. He's got a lot of know-how, technical skill and common sense that he didn't have before, and he's more mature. And here's something, he's more stable. He's had his belly full of adventure and violence, enough to last him for the rest of his life. But the face is the same, and you'll find the heart is the same. He hated war from the beginning, and he hates it more now. He did a good, decent, tough, and necessary job. But more than any of us, he's ready for peace and determined to make it stick. What does he want? With the sight of home still beyond the horizon, he's undeniably thinking of a number of things. The longest sleep in the softest feather bed the world has ever known. A steak so thick it would take a buzz saw to cut it. A platoon of bathing beauties who only have eyes for him. But when the idle dream has drifted, most of all, the average soldier, sailor, marine, coast guardsman, wants simply to be an average civilian. An average civilian with all the responsibilities and rights of one. Plans? Well, about one out of 10 plans to go to school, trade or college. About one out of 10 hopes to have a business of his own. About one out of 10 wants to operate a farm. But for the great preponderant majority, the basic need and the fundamental desire is a job. Over two thirds of the men getting out of the army want a job. Eight out of 10 of these want to work in the same state they came from. Many more than half of them want different jobs than they held before. And almost all of them want a job characterized not so much by the big money as by permanence, by security. And don't think the average serviceman comes out of the war able only to fire a rifle or crawl on his belly. He returns armed for a civilian future with training and skills adapted to an amazing variety of civilian jobs. 
He has held over 1,000 military jobs in the armed forces, ranging from bugler to surveyor to x-ray technician. All of these jobs are related in some way to 17,500 civilian occupations covering 130 industries. Conversions from military to civilian jobs can be made immediately with no additional training by many men. The construction workers, the truck drivers, the carpenters and telegraphers and airplane mechanics, the meat inspectors and tire workers and locomotive repairmen, hundreds of others. All these military jobs can obviously find their counterpart in civilian life. Some men may require additional study or on-the-job training to adapt their new skills to non-military use, but there are wide opportunities for the men who served in radio repair work, auditors, chemists, medical corpsmen, camoufleurs, able seamen, hundreds of others. And aside from technical skills, the armed services now return men equipped with executive ability, men who have had large groups under their command, from a colonel leading a bombardment group to a mess sergeant supervising the meals of an infantry company. This man and woman, the rifleman and the logging foreman, and the armor plate welder, and the radio mechanic. And the thousand odd others of him now return. he want? Most of all, he wants a job. Not a handout, not sympathy, not hero worship. But one of the things he fought for, the thing he returns for, a stake in the American future. He returns with a new sense of responsibility, of initiative, with new skills acquired, with old skills sharpened. As he returns from the wars, he represents, once again, the best of America. Twelve million men and women returning to civilian life. The greatest asset, the most capable potential group of workers, businessmen, farmers, students, citizens, the nation has ever known. He has earned a welcome to outlast the joyous whistles and the paper streamers. We welcome him to our hearts, but we must also welcome him to our benches and our desks, to our shops and fields, so that once again he becomes part of us, part of what he fought to make possible, a bolder, better, more democratic land. We must match his courage his vigor and his faith.